I do a talk for the patient symposiums called What's Hot, What's Not. It just cuts to the chase, telling you what's hot in my lectures, uh, what might not be hot, just to make it simplistic. So let's just do that. So what's hot is inserting your dog in basically most of your lectures. There's no one that gets offended by that. In today's medical meetings, you can't really, you don't have much latitude to make a joke, but if you insert your dog, you will always get high evaluations. So what I will tell you is that um, if you're a novice to this business and you really wanna be invited back to medical meetings, just put your dog in basically every single slide and it's a winner. So here's my moyad vernacular cisplain. That's hot, it's from Paris Hilton, but I coined the phrase hot or not. Hot means it's trending in a positive, wonderful direction. Cold means it's trending in a not so positive direction. For example, Michigan football. We beat Ohio State, and I was at the game, and of course I was all masked up, and it has been like 20 years, and there was total insanity afterward, but I wasn't willing to go on the field because there is the COVID thing. But um, what's hot is Michigan football, clearly. All right, now I'll go alphabetically through my list, and let's talk about what's not hot, which might surprise you. Acetaminophen is not hot. What? See, we kind of picked on the NSAIDs most of our career. The NSAIDs, they increase the risk of ulcers. They cause uh, essentially arterial um, vasoconstriction. So basically what that means is they could be kidney unfriendly. They can increase the risk of hypertension. And what you saw in many of the advertisements of the acetaminophen was it was the heart healthy or the heart friendly alternative. But what people didn't realize is that was never really subject to intense scrutiny. So finally you get a trial that nobody in urology should know about, but I'm gonna tell you about that was just published, a randomized trial crossover, beautifully done, called the PATH-BP trial, published in circulation a few weeks ago, just to show you how update we are in this meeting, showing that four grams a day clearly increased blood pressure by about five systolic points, equivalent to that of non steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs within two weeks, and they used the perfect validated measure of proof, which is ambulatory blood pressure monitoring, not just using a monitor 24 hours in these patients, not just taking a blood pressure in the clinic. So this is going to get really interesting because for the longest time, acetaminophen was the heart healthy alternative. Now, what do you do with this data? Well, there's going to be more research, but this is an ongoing number of studies, and this is the strongest yet to show that high dose acetaminophen is not only the number one cause of acute liver failure in the United States, but may also be heart unhealthy, but to what degree this still has to be figured out, should mention it to patients. Aspirin is sort of hot and cold right now. What does that mean? It's hot in the area of colon cancer prevention, uh, preeclampsia prevention now. The United States Preventative Services Task Force says you should take it. Secondary prevention after a heart attack, after an ischemic event. But breast cancer, which I follow more than prostate cancer, actually in my field because they have 10 times the funding in this area. So it always provides some kind of insight as to what we might experience in prostate cancer. They had a trial that was just published, actually it was presented at ASCO, it hasn't been officially published yet, called the ABC trial. It was an adjuvant trial, 338 sites, phase three, and it did not beat placebo in terms of impacting uh, progression and recurrence uh, as an, in the adjuvant setting. So what does that mean for prostate? What it means for prostate is we're waiting on four phase three trials to finish. And you can always go to this website. It's called the adaspirintrial.org. It's four phase three trials. It's fairly brilliant being done around the world. And one of those phase three trials is after curative therapy for prostate cancer, again, to see if you can reduce the risk of recurrence. They've already randomized Seven, as of yesterday, 1,744 patients in the prostate cancer arm. So in the next year or two, we're gonna learn, is aspirin after surgery or radiation or in high-risk patients, is that a smart move in low dose and high dose? We're looking at both. Or is this a bad move? So just watch the ad aspirin trial, but it's tough to make a hot or cold decision on it just now. Why should you know about infantile hemangioma? I, I, I remember this meeting four years ago, and you can see it in the tape. Uh, Crawford stood up and said, why are you bringing this up? Where, where do you think this is going? And I said to him, I don't know where it's going. I don't know if people are going to keep researching this or not. What you may not realize is that one of my favorite areas to look at and watch the data in is the essentially uh, drug repurposing. It's a very interesting area. So for example, the drug repurposing going on with 
sildenafil and pulmonary hypertension, that's already a approved drug, and they're looking at the sildenafil right now and Alzheimer's disease. But what people don't realize is that the most common benign tumor of infancy is an infantile hemangioma, sometimes called strawberry birthmarks. But the main treatment is propranolol. It's a beta blocker. It causes involution, so especially for life-threatening growths, it blocks angiogenesis, and that's the first-line treatment. Also, beta blockers are used for things like essential tremors, right? They're used for stage fright situations. They're obviously used in atrial fibrillation. They have all these indications, migraine prevention. Well, in Europe, one of the larger looks, essentially, was a drug repurposing look in Norway with over 1,000 patients, and they found patients who are on non-selective beta blockers like propranolol, so non-selective meaning other parts of the body, it might reduce epinephrine, norepinephrine, reduce the stress response, was associated with a lower risk of recurrence. Now again, this is a very strong observational study, but you're starting to see beta blockers in some capacity being moved into smaller clinical trials. So right now, beta blockers, antihypertensives in general, but beta blockers are hot. I always like to argue, though, that stress is a, I mean, that exercise is a mini beta blocker in the way that it controls heart rate and reduces stress and anxiety. What else is hot is the calorie trial. You've probably never heard of the calorie trial, but the calorie trial was a cardiovascular trial launched by a cardiologist at Duke. Uh, it's a terrible acronym to memorize, Comprehensive Assessment of Long uh, Term Effects of Reducing Intake of Energy. Jesus, I need a prize for that. So. Here's the thought. Why are we inundating these patients with all these different dietary demands? Here's my demand, that we're going to take two groups, a control group and another group that's overweight, and we're going to essentially just tell them to reduce 25% of their calories daily working with healthcare professionals. That's it. You can pick. You're just going to reduce 25% of your calories daily. Now, if you realize in any trial of exercise and diet, no one's going to fully listen to you. They're going to listen to you partially. So at the end of two years, they were able to cut back on about 13% of calories, which was the equivalent of only 250 calories of a day, which is the equivalent of a piece of pizza. The average weight loss in these patients who were overweight, they weren't obese, just overweight, the average weight loss was 15 pounds. And all of your heart healthy markers also changed. I think this has enormous potential in the area of ADT, prostate cancer, where people are already inundated with enough rules, but I think flexibility will rule the day, and we should learn that from cardiology. Whether that's the intermittent fasting movement or the time-restricted eating movement, the idea of having at least some level of flexibility, and it's your pattern of dietary behavior, not your strict dietary behavior, that's going to increase the chances of long-term success. That's what we've learned from cardiology. What else is hot? All right, Crawford's hot right now. That's hot. That's incredible. I mean, 25, we're going to do a grand rounds in urology. How does someone able to do 25 in a row? That's hot. He makes exercise hot. So Jody ran it with him, right? You've run a couple too. And exercise, he makes it hot. Are you doing 26 next year? Wow, six weeks. So do you still need qualifying time for that? Or you have automatic acceptance? They pay me to run. That I agree with. I wouldn't, I wouldn't be surprised. So anyway, that's hot. The Boston Marathon's hot. By the way, the Boston Marathon is a, a treasure trove of dietary studies. Um, actually, looking at the participants in Harvard, it was one of the first um, case studies I looked at. 2002, published in the New England Journal of Medicine, a young woman collapsed and actually died at the Boston Marathon. And it was one of the first looks that patients can suffer from hyponatremia by drinking too much water, too many fluids during the Boston Marathon, which that ultimately led to other types of um, hydrating drinks, mixed you know, Gatorades and other things. And so the Boston Marathon is actually is a treasure trove of just following data and seeing how it changes nutrition and exercise. What's also hot is the ERACE trial. If you haven't heard about it, it was one of the most trending uh, studies, actually, for the entire year last year in JAMA Oncology. This is a wonderful group of researchers from Edmonton. And what they essentially did was they took active surveillance patients 
and they put them on a high intensity interval training program or no program. So high intensity interval means three times a week these patients get together, they get on a treadmill, they're supervised, and you initially start by you know, warming up and then doing two, two minutes of all out, two minutes rest, two minutes all out, two minutes rest. And you try to build that up, and ultimately in 12 weeks, their peak oxygen consumptions dramatically changed compared to the control group. They had decreases in PSA, PSA velocity versus the control group, but not doubling time. And then they take the serum there, and they see that it inhibits all sorts of cancer cell lines. But I think what's going to be really interesting is the quality of life data that comes out of this, which we haven't seen yet. Because I think ultimately, not only in 12 weeks can you improve the cardiorespiratory fitness of the active surveillance or any type of patient, but also the mental health benefits we're really going to start focusing on in the future. So for kudos for high-intensity interval training for prostate cancer patients being such a trending article last year from Edmonton. Uh, also what's trending and hot essentially is it's still metformin. Metformin has looked interesting over the past five years, whether it was a polyp reduction trial from Japan using a low dose, whether it was a phase three trial in breast cancer, which by an update in the past few weeks on the surface did not appear to work versus placebo after all these years, after five years. But now they're looking at the subset of the HER2 uh, positive patients that had significantly improved overall survival versus the placebo group. At the end of the day, even if you're not changing progression of the disease, you're causing metabolically healthy changes. You're reducing the risk of diabetes and pre-diabetics. So I think this is a very productive trials that are going on in breast and other places. MANSMED was a trial actually done um, outside the US. It was a randomized small trial of hormone sensitive prostate cancer patients, standard of care or standard of care plus metformin. And they're looking at a primary endpoint of CRPC. Um, and they found essentially that in the high risk or low volume patients, there seemed to be a benefit in a longer time of being castrate sensitive. Um, again, this is a preliminary publication, but maybe it bodes well for future studies coming out using metformin or not at uh, Stampede in 2024 and others. But at the end of the day, people always keep asking me, but what if it fails? Your moonshot prediction, it doesn't work. I don't want to sound callous, but I'm not saying I don't care, but the whole idea of using something like this is at least it's metabolically healthy. The patients are getting something by doing it. It's not an all or nothing scenario as some of the past trials have been. You're thinking first heart healthy and everything else is just gravy. All right, we've had past studies of metformin reducing the side effects of ADT. So metformin is definitely semi-hot. It also has reduced the risk of diabetes and pre-diabetics. That was published way back in 2002, but people forget that lifestyle changes has actually beat metformin in the diabetes studies when it's been put up head to head, but that never gets any commercials. I mentioned yesterday about semaglutide uh, trade names now are Wagovi, Rebelsis, uh, Ozembic. It comes in a lot of different forms, but they got an indication recently, a very broad indication from the FDA in June of 2021. It's a GLP-1 agonist, which essentially means we have an intestinal hormone, but not at this level, called GLP-1, and it makes people feel full, or it gives them sort of an aversion to wanting to, it makes them want to reduce their caloric intake. Nausea is one of the biggest initial side effects. Marty Minor can talk about this. He's worked with it, but it's very interesting. The data at 68 weeks and going on two years, 10 to 15% of weight loss in the majority, that's what you see with bariatric surgery. And I keep waiting to think, well, when's the other shoe gonna drop? And it's now two years. And if this continues, researching in this urology to see if you can raise testosterone in hypogonadal patients after they lose 15% of their body weight? Or can you put someone on ADT on this drug that you're concerned about, seeing that the average ADT patient now has a BMI of 29 to 30 at baseline? So I think urology should be watching some of glutide very carefully. And uh, it's obviously trending and it's very hot. 
So is metabolic surgery. One of my favorite papers from the Cleveland Clinic last year that didn't receive much attention is looking at their patients that lost weight and they followed them essentially during the COVID pandemic and saw with all of your main endpoints, hospitalization, severe COVID, mortality, the need for supplemental oxygen, these kind of reductions in numbers after surgery compared to the groups that did not see this kind of weight loss is something you would see out of a drug that could get a Nobel, pie, Nobel Prize. So metabolic surgery, it's so funny how they say it's an elective procedure, where in some people, obviously it changes lives. Plant-based diets are super hot. PLCO, the prostate lung colorectal ovarian trial is still hot. That was the trial associated with all the controversy of PSA screening, but what got missed why everybody was yelling at each other, it's kind of like politics when Republicans, Democrats yell at each other, what gets missed is some of the good stuff that we all agree on. PLCO has great lifestyle research going on. And in the past few years, they found that exercise reduced nocturia in older men. Fiber reduces the risk of adenomas. Coffee's good for you. Weight loss recently reduces the risk of colon polyps. Weight gain increases the risk of colon polyps. They've done all sorts of things with this randomized trial and lifestyle data, um, whether it's Andriol and others, that just deserve a hell of a lot of credit for doing all this lifestyle research around this randomized trial that will always be known about the controversies of PSA screening when it should be known about lifestyle. Statins are super hot. Rather, a finished randomized trial at the end of 2021 showed that you may actually reduce the risk of the detection of insignificant tumors, which would be wonderful, to I can't even go through the list in the past six months of how positive the data on statins in men's health have been. Let me see if I can go through the year that statins had, which is pretty remarkable. What they found in, a, in essentially a trial was it increases calcium density. What that means is you're light, less likely to have vulnerable plaque. If you are less likely to have vulnerable plaque, you reduce the risk of sudden cardiac death. So maybe one of the key ways that statins are actually working is it's taking that piece of vulnerable plaque, making it more compact. You're essentially taking a pothole and you're filling it in with very good material so it's a pothole is not created again. There were Denmark studies and other studies showing that even elderly men and women who discontinued their statins even after the age of 75, essentially was associated with significant harm in cardiovascular events within a year or two years after discontinuing with a number needed to harm essentially in the one to 50 to 1 to 100. It was striking. Now Finland did a study of Lipitor, a torvastatin, showing that it causes adrenal androgen downshift of a variety of adrenal androgens that could be fueling prostate tumors. Harvard also looked at that. There was a recent meta-analysis that just got published showing out of all your different studies out there, it really seems to have value in the high-risk patient to reduce the risk of biochemical recurrence. And now the United States Preventative Services Task Force is going to update their data on the primary prevention of cardiac events with statins, and they're going to suggest it reduces all-cause mortality. Let me repeat that. You go find me any pill, over-the-counter, any piece of candy, I don't care what it is, any prescription drug in a primary prevention setting, that reduces all-cause mortality, it doesn't exist, except, of course, lifestyle. Supplements in bladder and prostate cancer are cold right now. Whether it was the SELECT trial or the study that's, or the, the doctor that's come up after this on folic acid, which you're going to find absolutely fascinating. I'm so glad for our next speaker. Um, but what's been going on in prostate, apart from selenium and vitamin E, is a quiet story of folic acid that freaks people out whenever we do interviews on this. We are not suggesting that women who want to become pregnant or are pregnant don't take folic acid. Of course we know it significantly reduces the risk of neural tube defects, one of the greatest public health stories in the world. What I am arguing lately is if you're a 65-year-old man who doesn't want to become pregnant anytime soon, should you be taking this kind of folic acid day in and day out when we know it's involved in DNA and RNA synthesis and possibly increased risk of recurrence? So MD Anderson and Baylor, two et al. in 2018, did not publish in a urology journal. They looked on their data series and found that folic acid supplements significantly increased the risk of bladder cancer recurrence. 
And now in other trials, they're finding a couple other problems, including an infertility trial in the past few years that was government funded. And so I'll leave that story as it is before our next speaker comes up and talks to you about what's happening with folic acid right now in prostate cancer. Sodium reduction right now is hot. What do I mean by that? We know it reduces stones, we know it reduces blood pressure, and now there's new data to suggest overall that when you get too much sodium, it essentially impacts diet-induced thermogenesis. What's that mean? So when you burn calories, you burn calories by sitting there listening to this amazing lecture, or you burn calories by going out and running today or going skiing, right? But there's a third way you burn calories also. When you eat, there's a thermogenesis effect. That's your basic metabolism that occurs when you eat. Some people burn more calories during the food digestion process, others don't. What they're seeing with sodium is that it encourages weight gain probably also in a variety of ways, including slowing the metabolism from preliminary studies. So this whole sodium talk in cardiovascular disease should be a sodium talk in other places. Here's my demo of the day, just to make sure people are, just to make sure people are awake. This was a story that came out this week that surprised all of us in the whole public health prevention world. So I'm not going to say what company this is. This is a fizzy. And you look at it, and boy, isn't that awesome. Look, I'm going to drink this, whether it's a supplement or anything else that comes in there, or maybe I have a hangover or something, and it just fizzies up that sodium bicarbonate, and it's awesome. And a group of researchers finally looked at the sodium content of these fizzies, and some of them are running 500 to 700 milligrams per pill. So you're basically getting your RDA of sodium in just a couple of these pills if you take them regularly. And so it's turned out to be another significant, quiet, source of sodium exposure that's listed as an inactive ingredient in drugs and supplements, but it doesn't look very inactive to me. Um, as we move to the end, I'm moving on vaccines. I thought, personally, one of the bigger mistakes we've made in public health is we have focused too much on the side effects of vaccines, and we have not focused on the side benefits of vaccines. So there was a randomized trial in Europe in patients that had cardiovascular events, heart attacks, and they randomized them. Imagine this. Published in one of our main heart journals, Circulation. It was called the IAMI trial. They randomized the flu shot to heart attack patients or placebo, and within a year saw a reduction in all-cause mortality and further cardiovascular events when everything else was the confounding variables we'll take, were looked at. The University of Miami in Florida has looked at flu studies reducing the risk of severe COVID. The CDC at the end of the year published one of their largest looks at integrative health systems in the United States and found a significant impact on non-COVID related deaths, significant reduction in non-COVID related deaths with the COVID vaccine. And now the shingles vaccine from the Medicare database seems to be associated with a lower risk of stroke. What the hell is going on here? I'll tell you what we think is going on. When you suffer any sort of infection, whether it's acute or chronic, there's a massive inflammatory response. When that massive inflammatory response takes place, things can go wrong. Things can be encouraged. Plaques can break off. Other ugly things can happen. PSAs can go up. The bottom line is if you can prevent the severity of that chronic inflammatory response, what other benefits pay off down the road? And I think we're going to just start learning, we're at the tip of the iceberg, that the side benefits of many of our adult vaccinations need to get more credit. But yet in the United States, most adults are at 25 to 50 percent compliance with their adult vaccinations. The next time you see a prostate cancer patient, please ask them to go back to their primary care and get caught up on all their adult vaccinations and mention some of the side benefits. How many people in this room know there are two papers now published, for example, not only on intravesical BCG, but BCG, BCG vaccine possibly lowering the risk of Alzheimer's disease? Of course, that's preliminary, but it's fascinating because of all these potential ancillary benefits. We know now the HPV vaccine, not just in women, but in men, is a cancer prevention vaccine. And we know that a very large number of head and neck cancers taking place are HBV related. So maybe one of the smartest things we can do besides talking to women, but talk to men also about HPV vaccination because the age group has been extended for many men. All right, as I finish up here, um, 
The other thing that's cold, though, about vaccines, it's, it's, it's not cold, it's a hot topic, I should say, is that as everybody talks about all these great PET CT scans, and I love these PET CT scans, we're going to have to come to the recognition that many lifestyle and things that you do affect the reading of these scans. Whether we've already learned that with action and exercise and diet, whether you learn that about FTG, what's going to impact, what's going to impact these PSMA scans? Well, right now what we're seeing in other scans is that within a couple weeks of having your mRNA vaccine, you can get ipsilateral axillary lymph node reactivity. And so how does this play out for PSMA? Also, cervical lymph node activity is taking place. And a paper just published in the past few weeks at Mayo showed that with choline PET-CT, they were seeing this axillary and other site reactivity within a couple of weeks of the mRNA vaccine, and then by a month later, it subsided. And so what this could do is create a false positive, so we have to learn more about this. But this is just this onslaught of activity I'm excited about to study what really affects these scans that can create these false positives and false negatives. Vitamin D is hot, but not for what you think. They just finished a phase three trial and it reduced the risk of autoimmune disease in a Harvard study. So I wanna leave you with a few messages as we end here today. People have to quit looking at supplements as all or nothing. A supplement that works is a drug, but a supplement like a drug needs to find a home. I'm more excited about supplements in their future than ever before. I'm just not that excited about it in prostate cancer. In the area of autoimmune disease, if this turns out to be true from this phase three trial, this will be the first intervention to prevent autoimmune disease that rheumatologists will have. In fact, if you look at the editorial from the rheumatologist that runs a lupus clinic in Boston, She's saying that immediately they're going to start using this. Maybe this is where vitamin D has found its home in the area of autoimmune disease prevention. So as I end, here's my quick summary. Blood pressure reduction is hot. Crawford's 25 Boston marathons are hot. Exercise is hot with the ERASE trial and active surveillance patients. Less is more in terms of supplementation after you've been diagnosed with prostate cancer. Metformin is hot and cold. Michigan football will always be hot. Plant-based diets, PLCO lifestyle research is hot. Semaglutide for weight loss is hot. Sodium reduction is hot. Statins are hot, but I'm getting more excited about the things that are gonna replace the statins, these things called PCSK9 inhibitors that already have two of those options out there. For example, Repatha's out there, and whether or not they impact all-cause mortality, which is what people are think they're doing in the primary prevention setting. Vaccine side benefits are hot. Vitamin D and fish oil are hot, but not in the area of cancer. They're hot in the area of autoimmune disease prevention. Weight loss is hot. Anything else very hot before I end? You're damn right. My wife and I are really hot. Thank you for your time. I appreciate it. <laughs>